Hi, everybody. Uh, so yeah, this is CLI catching user interfaces. Um, you can go to the bit.ly link there, and I've got the slides up and all the examples that we'll be going through today. Um, so I'll be using like pre-canned examples. There'll be no live coding, but I'm sure I'll do lots of live typoing as I try to run them. Uh, cool. So again, about me, I'm James, and I'm the technical lead at Manifold. Um, I've worked on uh, many CLI tools over the years that you know most of them people don't use anymore as they've been obsoleted, uh, but they were you know still good at the time. Uh, and I love cats, and I love terminals, and I love my family as well. But that kind of goes without saying. Um, so this is one of my cats. This is Spooky using her ThinkPad. I don't remember what she was programming at the time. Um, and these are my terminals while I was working on this presentation. So this is sort of where I spend most of my time in a you know, beautifully organized set of terminals. And then over to one side is Chrome, and the other side is Slack. So today, you're going to learn how to make progress bars and spinners. You're going to learn how to decorate text. Um, a sort of you know, color and uh, formatting to draw anywhere within a terminal to get user input. And then we'll finish up with some fancy things like handling mice and images. You'll be able to do this safely on any operating system, as long as it's a recent version of Mac OS, Linux, or Windows. <laughs> and as long as it's one of the common terminal programs. Um, now, with that said, a lot of these, uh, what we'll be looking at is widely applicable, but you know, I only had so much time, and I wasn't able to sort of cover everything. Uh, notice, notably absent from this is um, command line argument parsing and environment variables. So we'll be looking sort of past the initial execution of a program. Um, but these things are very important, right? And um, you know, find a good. Uh, argument or flag parsing library and you know use it. Um, it's sort of the, the first place where when you're building a CLI you get that contact point with your user. Uh, and then what we'll be looking at isn't just for Go. So feel free to share these system calls and escape sequences with all your you know Pythonista and Rubyist friends out there. Uh, when, it, when it comes time to actually write you know real code, use a package instead of the you know, the calls we're doing here, because they'll handle the sort of the, the cross-platform bits for you. Uh, and of course, every talk needs a why go slide. Um, and so why go is awesome for CLIs, and sort of why uh, a few years ago we picked it up for um, building our CLIs. Uh, is that it really does have, especially at this level of the, the console or the terminal, it, it does have really great support sort of across the big three operating systems. Um, and when you are developing these, you know, you've got trivial cross compilation. And uh, it's, you know, as a self contained binary, it's very easy to package up and, and ship off. Um, and we can just send it to users as a, a tarball or whatever. And as much as that might bother, you know, the people who want to put it in a proper package, this is a, a quick way to get going. And then we can sort of, you know, build uh, sort of uh, correct packaging on top of that later. So um, again, sort of, well the, well, the pun for the name comes at the CLI. We're going to be looking sort of at the next level. Um, and I like to think of it as a level down in the hierarchy, but some people may say it's a level up. Um, we're going to be at the text-based user interface level, or the TUI, um, but we're not going to really get to the GUI level. So we'll be here for most of the time today. OK, so we're going to get started sort of with the the basic here of just plain old characters. Um, and you've got your regular display characters, but you also have control characters. And I want to introduce you to carriage return. That's going to be your new best friend and secret weapon. So this isn't the carriage that uh, we're talking about, but I really like this picture. And it was one of the first <laughs> results, so we'll stick with it. Um, also, it's not a carriage, it's a cart, but you know. <laughs> Uh, so in this context, like a lot of things that we deal with with terminals come from, you know, virtual terminals come from physical terminals, come from teletypes, come from typewriters. So the carriage is the, that cylinder in an old typewriter that moves the paper back and forth. Um, so that, like, as the hammers kind of strike, 
there, the hammers for the typewriter are always hitting in one place, and the carriage is sliding the paper around on it. Uh, so carriage return returns the, the paper sort of back to the, you know, the, the starting side of it. And then you would, when, if you were typing, you would follow it up with a line feed and go down to the next line. And that's where you know, Windows has its sort of carriage return line feed um, sort of file encoding. Uh, but we can use carriage return on its own and um, you know, across every operating system and, and sort of build a nice progress bar. And this is sort of like base entry, right? Your easiest way to get some kind of interactivity on the CLI. Um, so let's start with uh, an example here. And we'll run our demo. Um, so we're about halfway through the demo now. <laughs> All right. So what happened here? Um, oh, cool. The other thing about me besides having you know, organized terminals is that I have all kinds of copies of Vim running. Um, so it's sort of your, your basic layout for a, a CLI program is you've got you know, two or more Go routines, right? And in this case, our, our main Go routine is the one that's drawing our output. And then we've got the secondary Go routine that's simulating some kind of work and reporting status out. Uh, so we're you know, ranging over this channel that we're sharing and then sort of passing, passing this through the draw bar to uh, get our, um, our progress being displayed. Uh, so we'll just pop back in here and go over that function. Um, so I've just hard-coded the number of columns that we want to use for our display. Um, and then we can you know, figure out how many sort of equal signs we should fill in for our progress bar and then print this out. We'll look a li little bit more at the, the fump line here. Um, of course, there's the slash r, which is our carriage return, so you know, the, the real worker here. Um, but then there's these parameterized um, you know, parts of the print string, which I always tend to forget about, so I thought they were worth talking about. Um, in that you can, you can actually say, like, instead of just doing you know, percent three, you can give a parameter and say, hey, use arg1 for this place. So we're padding it with, uh, you know, with three spaces, uh, and then literal percent. And then for this one, you know, the minus says to left justify, um, and then use the value of arg3 to figure out how much we want to pad it by. So this is where our calls come in. And um, if we were resizing the progress bar based on the, you know, the size of the terminal, then you could just pass that in as an argument. You wouldn't have to construct the, the formatting string like by hand beforehand. And then you know, print the actual progress bar. So your other new secret weapon is Unicode. Uh, again, another sort of easy way to get into it. And uh, Carriage Return is a big fan of Unicode. Um, you may have noticed. I guess we'll just run this one as well first. There's my first few typos here. Uh, right. So we can have some nice little spinners. I don't know if that's probably not big enough to see, but. Nice little clock, you know, spinning around. And um, the other thing that's sort of all the rage these days in, um, in command line spinner technology is, uh, <laughs> is the, uh, oh, maybe if I edited it, it would work better. Is the, um, come on, the Braille characters, right? So uh, we'll come back to why they are slices of runes in a second, but the code here is, is basically the same layout as a progress bar, right? Is we, we have something that's reporting status, and in this case, we're using a spinner, so we don't really, you know, we say, okay, we don't actually know how much work is, is to be done, so we're just going to, like, spin something around. Um, but we do need some way to sort of move forward on it. So we're using the same kind of mechanism of passing through a channel. And then the, uh, the draw function for this one is just sort of getting, uh, you know, indexing into these and then doing a modulus to wrap around to the end. So, uh, right, the, the rune slices. Um, we'll also come back to this gain, but uh, if this was a string, um, it wouldn't be as easy to index into it, right? Because these characters are all uh, multi-byte characters. So if we wanted to say, like, the give me the second thing in this 
in this string that's actually like the second byte, and these are UTF-8 encoded, so that's going to be like halfway through a clock, and it's not going to look good. You know, and then there's other things you can do, right? We can add some more emoji as we go through our command line. Um, but the thing about Unicode is um, <laughs> some things can go wrong with it, right? So this one, the missing characters in a type. So this is actually a, uh, oh, went the wrong way. Um, that was actually the power symbol, right? And in a few years, when I come back to these slides, it's going to be filled in properly. And I'm going to be like, what was I thinking? But um, right now, the typeface that I'm using doesn't have a, a, a glyph for the power symbol code point. So on this typeface, I just get these square boxes. And you don't really have any way to know if, um, if a user's terminal, the typeface they're using, is able to display the characters that you ask for or not. So you just kind of, kind of, you know, either give an option to use them or not, or sort of go with it and, you know, let it fail. Uh, again, the fun thing about uh, multi-byte characters is uh, that you can miscount things. So our smiley face here is one rune, but four bytes. Um, and then there are wide characters, uh, which is also really fun on a um, you know, monos monospace display like a terminal. So this character is, is two characters wide. Sorry, this rune is two characters wide. Um, this rune with library is, is super cool. I, I found that while I was putting this together. Uh, it'll actually figure out you know, how, many, um, how, how many sort of characters wide a rune is. And then the last thing is that there are characters that are rendered you know, wider than, or runes that are rendered wider than um, what they're supposed to be. So the manicule here, the little pointy hand um, that I'm so fond of is, uh, is taking up two spaces on this slide. But if we look at, um, if we look at here, it's actually overriding the O character. So, um, you know, lots of fun to be had there. You can probably actually do some, some silly things by having characters right over top of each other and make weird looking UIs, you know, if you wanted to. All right, so moving right along to part two, we're gonna look at escape codes. So we've looked at just regular characters, but now we can combine characters in the sort of, in the output stream uh, to manipulate how the terminal displays things. So typically, this starts with the escape character. Um, for whatever reason, I always write it in octal notation, although you'll also see it in, um, you know, in hex, which would take one less character. Uh, and then most of them uh, follow with the square bracket. Uh, and this is standardized. So thank you, ANSI. Um, so we'll look at some examples for this. So it, for first set here, we've got a bunch of text decoration and color. So for decorations, um, let's look at the, what would that be, four? Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, edit. So, you know, it's all just a bunch of this escape bracket, some number, and then M, which is saying, hey, this is like a, uh, a modifying an attribute on the characters. We've got a whole bunch of different ones here. Um, there is this one, invisible. Uh, don't use this one for hiding passwords. It just makes it so the characters don't show up on the terminal, uh, but they're still actually written out, so you could copy and paste them or whatever. Um, also, it doesn't work in many terminals. So I'm using iTerm here, and uh, you know, invisible is clearly visible. Oh. <laughs> uh, but we can run this on, um, I think it should work here. You know, if we run this on GNOME terminal, then all of the, all the attributes are actually working properly. Uh, so there's sort of a limited subset that you can always depend on. You'd like bold, underline, and reverse would be the ones that you can kind of get everywhere. Um, but, uh, you know, there is others that you could sort of, you could use if you wanted to, and, and if the terminal can't handle it, it's typically, in almost all cases, just going to display the text as like normal text. So if the terminal didn't support italics, it would just be you know, regular text here. All right, so character size. This one is not well supported at all, but 
I actually I just came across it while I was putting this together, and I thought it was super great, so I wanted to to show it. Um, because I think there's like a whole new world, or old world, I guess, of potentials that we could do with CLIs on this. Um, so this one is like a hash, you know, three, four, and six. Um, you can do characters that are twice as wide and twice as tall, or just ones that are twice as wide. Uh, and when you're doing these sort of the full double size ones, you specify the line separately. Uh, so if we look at this, this isn't going to work in, in I term, so I'll just go right over to uh, X term for this one. And I apologize for the size here. It's, as, it's, uh, it's set on huge, but you know, it's as, as big as it will go. Uh, but see, so you can get the double size here and actually sort of split things up. So the fun thing with that um, is that you could you know, print emoji and do half and half. So you can do like, you know, combine faces and stuff. And again, I think there's lots of potential there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So moving right along to color. Uh, we've got three different color modes that are supported uh, across different terminals. Um, the first one is just sort of eight colors, and this is our escape code angle bracket, and then sort of the, you know, the numeric value of this color, and then M. Uh, and then we have a 256 color palette, and then a 24-bit uh, true color palette. Uh, the great thing about all of these is that it's very easy to determine if they're supported in a terminal or not. Uh, and even if the terminal doesn't support 24-bit color, it'll usually downsample into 256 uh, colors. So if we run this, yeah, I've got um, a nice palette there. But we can, we can see the original eight, and then you can modify them with bold and dim to sort of mix it, mix it up. And, uh, and then our 256 colors. There's this weird, I don't know why this color palette was chosen. It's um, interesting. But you know, you get nice grayscale here as well. And then I've just done a sort of sample of the 24-bit color here. Uh, so yeah, so the, the fun thing about that is, um, oh, sorry, is that in X term here, which supports the 256 color palette, but it doesn't support true color, so it will do downsampling here. But you know, it, it's close enough, so unless you're like, trying to render you know, fine art in the terminal, you're probably OK with sticking with your color. I guess just wait till the final demo. <laughs> OK, so uh, multi-line output with cursor movement. So um, I was trying to think of a way to show this without having to get into some of the you know, further techniques and thought back to a Wolfenstein where your character you know, where your character dies and you get shot, and then the screen fills in with these red pixels. Um, and there's this great article about how this is done uh, in the link here, but it uses this linear feedback shift register, and it takes up only 32 bits, and it's deterministic, so the, the way this goes out every time is the same. Um, so, I'll do seven. So if we look at this one, this is just a copy of this fizzle fade algorithm. Um, and I've hard coded the, the terminal size here. But basically what this does is we, we come in and we reset our character attributes just in case it was like stuck on you know, uh, blue or whatever for the background. And then we're going to <coughs> use this control sequence here with the question mark. Um, and these ones with, the, with L here and then H down below, just sort of modify, you know, like sort of modes of the terminal. And in this case, we are disabling display of the cursor. So, because otherwise, the, you know, this white box will bounce around as we go. And then we do our little fizzle fade thing and then wipe everything fully and sort of reset cursor position. So, if we do that, we can, oh gosh, it broke. Oh well. <laughs> um, because my terminal is actually wider than, or uh, smaller than 80 characters now, because I wanted to make sure that y'all could, could read stuff. 
But if we did it like again, there we go, things will stay there. Cool, that looked better. So, right, so we saw there um, clearing the screen, like at that final step that just sort of wiped everything out, and then uh, absolute cursor positioning. There are also um, commands to do relative cursor movements. So you can move up, down, left, right, you know, n number of, of uh, spaces. Um, and then you can do partial screen clearing. So below where the cursor is, above, on the line, half the line, uh, all kinds of fun stuff there. So we're about halfway through. I'm going to grab a sip of water and uh, sort of hinted at that there's a bunch of these things that, you know, how do you know if you can use it or not, right? Is it safe to actually render these? What we've looked at so far is characters and control sequences, and these are things that are um, handled entirely sort of by the display client, by the terminal itself, and your program may be on the other side of an SSH connection, right? So you don't have sort of direct access. But, uh, you know, and it can get really bad, right? So this is supposed to be the, um, the Utah teapot, that sort of 3D teapot rendering uh, in Regis format, which is a vector format that some terminals can display. Uh, and my terminal could not display it. So this is what I got instead. And, you know, this is common, like if you're trying to do escape sequences in the wrong place, um, you'll just end up with gobbledygook. But how can we tell if we can use things or not? Uh, the number one way is environment variables. So every terminal will set you know, term equals whatever. Um, and this is how we know sort of the, the family that it is and what sort of cover, if it supports, like typically we'll go from X term to X term 256 color. So you know if it supports two, the 256 color palette. Um, you know, and then a DOS command prompt just won't have this set. So you know you're under that, under DOS in that case, or um, I guess Windows command com. Uh, and then there's this color term variable, which will tell you if the terminal supports uh, true color or not, the, so the 24-bit color. Some terminals will set this, um, and they actually just mean that they'll support true color by downsampling to 256 color. So uh, you may need to look at some terminal-specific value to decide what to do there. Uh, so iTerm on, on Mac OS will set this, like, term underscore program to iterm.app, and then it'll set like term underscore version to the version of the uh, terminal. So you can use that to determine, like, oh, is this you know, new feature supported in my terminal? But the big thing is we take these, you know, the value of term, and we, we look it up in a term info database. Um, so this sort of starts way back in curses and end curses, like the sort of original full screen toolkits for uh, terminal UIs. Um, and you'll just sort of have a mapping of terminal name to capabilities. Uh, so we can say, all right, th yeah, this terminal supports this kind of color palette, and it supports this set of um, escape sequences. You know, maybe it doesn't support uh, absolute cursor positioning, but it does support relative cursor positioning. Uh, and in some cases, the escape codes, although you know, sort of based off uh, old DEC terminals and largely standardized may have some quirks, and they will be uh, included in a good term info database. So this is the sort of the best way to be really portable about um, using escape sequences. Even though all the examples, you know, printed them out uh, directly, it's better to go through uh, term info to get the right sequence. Um, and there are plenty of options in this for Go. Some of them will use like a the system term info, um, and others will bundle it up so that uh, you know even if you ship this thing to a system that didn't have a term info database installed, you could still use it and support something over SSH that has told you that it's X term. And then you know your last option is to rely on the user. Uh, I originally had a, a sad face on this, and it's like oh we have to fall back to you know having a user prompt. Um, but I think it's a good idea to actually like, you know, give the user a choice in these cases. Sometimes they don't want fancy colors, or they don't want to have an interactive output at all. Uh, and since you can't really know what 
you know, what Unicode characters they support, you may want to give them an option to disable using Unicode or not. So the, the big thing that's sort of been left out so far is handling Windows. Um, and the great news is that Windows 10, uh, you can enable this sort of virtual terminal processing, which lets it handle ANSI escape sequences like every other uh, system, um, which is really great. So look at an example of that. Hey. Oh, yeah. Now I have to try to get my Windows <laughs> legs back. <laughs> I sat here for like 10 minutes earlier typing clear, 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 and then I had to remember it was CLS. Um, so it's all still there. So if we look at uh, Windows VT processing, look, we've got bold, underline, and reverse. Really awesome. Um, what's cool, though, is we can go into the Windows subsystem for Linux, and we can run the exact same binary and get the same output. Uh, so if we go back. You know, we're just doing our same escape codes, but we've got this new init output a little bit here. Um, and hey, we've got our term underscore Windows file that will you know, use the Windows build tag. Um, and we're going to hook into kernel 32.dll, get some handles on some, um, some you know, Windows APIs. And uh, what we're going to do is switch on this enable virtual terminal processing flag. Uh, once that's done, then we can, you know, for all these ANSI sequences, we can just sort of stop touching the Windows API and just run through ANSI sequences, which is uh, pretty cool. Otherwise, you'd sort of you'd be using, you know, these um, kernel 32 console APIs to, to modify things, which we will get back to. Uh, yeah, so for other versions, like for Windows 7, you will just sort of have to go right to the to those APIs, or the package you're using will. Um, and then the typical pattern here is to sort of wrap um, an I.O. writer and sort of interpret the escape sequences and then make the Windows API calls for you. So yeah, the, the Windows subsystem for Linux, it's pretty cool because you can... Um, you know, you can use your ANSI escape codes and, and POSIX syscalls under Windows. Uh, running uh, Linux binaries. Um, but you can call Windows binaries from WSL, and you can call Linux binaries from Windows when you have like the WSL set up. Uh, and the, the specific sort of system calls don't cross between those two. Um, so that's kind of sad. Um, I would love to see if there was a way to sort of bundle that all up, have a single binary that was able to be used in, in both locations or, you know, either location and do the right thing. Um, well, definitely something I want to look into more. OK, so system calls. Uh, this is where we do out-of-band signaling. So, so far, we've done things that are in our character stream. And now we're going to look at uh, things that we have to do sort of outside of the character stream. Um, and again, this is also something that's standardized. So. This is in POSIX, and we can thank IEEE for that. And we can also thank Microsoft for you know, documenting their own APIs. So uh, the first thing that you're going to want to do with a terminal, with a CLI program that you can't sort of readily do um, through escape sequences, through in-band signaling, is for determining terminal size. Um, you know, and you want to do this to change your progress by si bar size or not mess up your screen clearing demo when you've made your terminal too large and then things scroll off like they did earlier. Uh, oop. So. so in this case, you know, typical sort of uh, standard here is to, hey, is to check to see if you're on some kind of terminal. Um, and, you know, in case their user is redirecting. Uh, and then um, you can, you know, do your terminal size call. So if we look at, just look at the, the one here for, that I've set up for Mac OS. Um, so we're using the Unix package to do syscalls. And the first thing to, to check if it's a TTY is to just sort of see if there's any 
you know, data on this file descriptor that says, yeah, I, I know something about it that says there's a terminal driver backing it. Um, the easiest way to do that is to, yeah, just look to see if there's any attributes set on it and you don't really care about what they are, just that it doesn't error um, when it comes out, so it's TTY. Uh, through all of the unices, we do, um, we do syscalls to sort of set and get these values, right? So Unix syscall, um, we're doing ioctals. Um, and then sort of what changes here is the sort of this, this argument uh, and it's different across sort of BSD or System 5. So for this Darwin, you know, we're doing TIO C set A, whatever that might mean, I don't know. Um, but it's like TC gets and TC sets for System 5. So once we've done that, then we can do our, um, and we've determined, yeah, this is a terminal, then we can go ahead and like look up the terminal size. So another system call for this, where we just sort of run it and, you know, pass in our, um, our data structure that will hold the response. And in this case, it's just uh, uh, an array of four UN16s, and one of them is our, you know, one of them is our rows and one's our columns. Uh, so the Windows sort of flow for this is largely the same, which is nice when you get into these out of band, you know, the things that we run sort of through the, these API calls, because they are sort of largely mirrored across everything. Um, but the Windows one is the, you know, response is much more involved. So we're getting this <coughs> console screen buffer when we want to find the terminal size. And, uh, you know, and this is a, a struct. And another reason why, you know, Go is super cool, right, is that the memory model underneath is the same as C. So we can pass this struct into a, uh, to this API call and it's going to populate data, and it's, we can then read it out of our struct sort of in, the, in its, um, the format that it's been populated by the API call, sort of maps up to our struct. So there's lots of stuff in there, but um, all we really care about is window, which is this uh, sort of um, rectangle that says what a, um, what a, a command prompt is, um, is focused on, right? So, We've got our scroller here, and if you look at the, the full size of the window, it's going to be like 9,000 um, rows long because it includes the full buffer. But if we look at the window, it's just going to be the, uh, the right size. So 110 columns and 27 rows. Uh, and over here, 184 columns and 51 rows. Uh, you can use... Um, the columns and lines environment variables to look up this stuff in some shells, so like bash will set it. But uh, if you're going to be sort of painting, you know, interactively for a while, you may as well do the system call. And you can also listen to the sig winch signal that will tell you when a window has resized and then just sort of reread it at that point rather than doing it on every sort of loop. All right, so, um, Getting input, uh, I talked earlier about, you know, don't use invisible for passwords. Um, you use uh, out-of-band signaling to sort of manipulate how the terminal, which is usually line-based, um, how it processes input and output. And you can switch it into like so-called raw mode, where instead of being line-based, it's going to be purely character-based, and it's not going to be doing any pre-processing of any characters. Uh, so the way to do this, and it's much easier on Windows, but I apologize, I don't have an example for that. Um, so the way to do this, if we go to term BSD, is, uh, am I in the wrong one? Oh, right. I actually did it for all unices. Um, is a sort of incantation here that no one really remembers what it means, but everyone just copies it out of this man page. Um, <laughs> and the man page itself was trying to reproduce the behavior of some old terminal. Uh, so it's like really fun. Um, you can sort of see some important ones here, like, like disabling echo, 
um, and disabling echo new lines. So when a user types a, you know, a character, it's not just going to automatically echo in the terminal. Uh, your program will get it first, and then you can decide if you want to print it or not. Uh, and this sort of, a lot of the other ones sort of follow that same sort of idea here. So if we, uh, oh, sorry, I'll look at the actual code here. Um, so our main, main uh, func here sort of gets the existing attributes of the terminal so we can restore them at the end. Uh, and again, we're going to hide the cursor for this case, and then we're going to run this loop. Uh, and this loop has the sort of the worst parsing that I could have done for, um, for parsing the input stream. But when you're in this mode, you're getting uh, escape sequences for up and down keys. Um, you know, and other characters as well. So you can parse those out. So if we run this one, you know, then we have this cool multi-line select where pressing up and down on the, on the keyboard can sort of move through the selection, and we can bump around in our list. And then in the same way, we have full control over what's displayed. So uh, you, we could get a uh, user, you know, user like password or any kind of secret typed in here, and we'd be able to echo nothing or echo, you know, like asterisks or whatever. Um, and we can also stop someone from hitting the like backspace key and just sort of overwriting our prompt. So, okay. So we're coming into the last part here, which is where we get into um, some sillier things uh, and just some, some assorted bits. But the first thing here is full screen interfaces. So the, the last one there, the multi-line select, it's sort of a you know, like an inline interface, right, where it's just sort of appearing in the user's terminal, uh, and they can do something. And then if you wanted, you could leave that full select up there, or you could sort of like write over it and just have their selection. Um, but for a full screen interface uh, like Vim, um, you know, you want to take over the, the entire terminal. And it's sort of a combination of um, getting that raw mode and then uh, uh, direct accessing the TTY device directly, so you would open up like dev TTY, and you do this so that it, the user could redirect standard out and standard air, and uh, you could still sort of display um, your full screen interface, and then you've got a channel to do some logging if you want. Uh, but then the, the cool bit here is this uh, alternate buffer. Um, so, oops. So we've got this, again, this control sequence here of 10, 1049, um, which will switch the terminal into a, a separate buffer. And then we can clear the screen and do some stuff. And then at the end, like how I just sort of ex or, uh, suspended Vim there, we can get back to the original terminal. So we can run this and get into this whole new world of, of uh, buffer and you know, display whatever we want here. And then when the program ends, then we're back to the original uh, you know, terminal, and the user still has all of their history and, and everything. All right, so displaying graphics. Uh, earlier, I showed a, uh, a Regis file that was not displayed properly. Uh, there is another format as well that's just as old. These are like from the, the 80s, uh, Sixel, um, or maybe earlier or later. Uh, Sixel is a sort of raster graphics format, so display you know, pixels. Um, and these are both supported to varying degrees of success in Xterm. But most people run Xterm in like VT100 or VT102 mode. So that's emulating a terminal that didn't have these features. You can use like these slash like TI, I think, flag, and then give like, you know, up to like VT like whatever, 340, you know, and start enabling some of these other features. But then other terminals have sort of implemented their own format for displaying graphics. Uh, iTerm is, is one, um, and there are some other ones uh, that sort of you know, are, are more on the fringe. Um, but if you wanted to, you could use sort of this, this iTerm way combined with Sixel, combined with falling back to you know, true color rendering of pixels to, to get some kind of like graphics display uh, across a, a wide variety of terminals. And then uh, mouse input. Mouse input is pretty well supported like across you know, every terminal. Um, but it's not supported in that Windows VT processing mode. Um, you have to fall back to using the API calls. 
because mouse input is done um, in band with escape sequences. Uh, and it's actually you know, bi-directional, right? So everything we've done has been to send a command out to the terminal. Um, and then once we got into raw mode, we got those up and down characters that were you know, coming back in. But in this case, uh, when we turn on mouse input, we will start getting a stream of these escape sequences that say uh, things about the mouse. So let's uh, look at an example here. So in this case, I've got you know, a gopher that'll follow my mouse around the screen, uh, which I couldn't think of anything useful to do here, so I thought at least it was a gopher up. <laughs> right, but it can follow it around. Um, and then if we go over to go over here, we've got a, a fallback that's, oh, that's the wrong one. Uh, we've got a fallback that will just show a mouse. Since we can't do graphics, we'll just use emoji for this. Uh, so so in this case, um, I'm using Fransec's image cat library. So he took care of rendering the, uh, the graphics um, in iTerm. Uh, and and for, for it, it's, it's actually just a, an escape sequence. They chose 1337 as their code. Um, and then it's sort of like a base64 encoded uh, version of the file. Uh, the fun thing about this is that there is a option in this escape sequence that says, am I going to display the file, or am I going to download the file? Um, so like all of those cool like SSH to this, you know, to this domain and watch Star Wars and uh, ASCII graphics, they could start downloading um, or uploading files to you when you connected, and you wouldn't know because your terminal was sort of happily grabbing them for you. But anyways, um, so we hide the cursor as before and go into our alternate screen mode. Um, and then we use this other control sequence, the 1003 to track mouse coordinates. Uh, and it does. Uh, uh, so in this case, we're getting all, all sort of mouse action, so any movement on the screen and, and clicks as well. You can also just get the clicks or get sort of um, enter and leave at, um, events. So if you wanted to you know, change, like sort of highlight things when the user hovered over your terminal, you could do that. And then we're using this term program variable to decide if we want to draw the graphics or not. And then we just go into our loop, which up here again, sort of horrible parsing, but it checks to see if we've got this sort of mouse input, or mouse info prefix, um, and then we, uh, you know, get the 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 right characters here to to figure out the um, the position. So the mouse coordinates are done um, in a single byte, uh, plus 32, so they're printable characters, um, and then they start at one one. And when we want to display it, we use it to sort of reflect back in the terminal. The terminal is uh, addressed you know, like zero based. So we've got to do a bit of math there. Uh, this does mean that the, um, the number of, of uh, characters that we can sort of, or the number of rows and columns we can track in a terminal is limited, right, to um, what can fit in a byte. But there's other modes you can enable that will um, change how the mouse position is sent back to you uh, and use sort of more more data for that, so you can have larger terminals. Cool. All right, so uh, that pretty much covers it, and I've just got a few links here if you want to you know, play around or learn more. Um, some of my favorite libraries, uh, and I'm you know, plugging one of my own here, of course. Um, but readline is great just for support of doing you know, single line stuff. Prompt UI is built on top of it for multi-line selects and stuff. Uh, T-Cell is a very cool full screen library. Um, and Go Rune With is the one I use to sort of count the number of characters it would take to display a rune. Uh, Matt N person also has a Go library to encode and decode files for Sixel. So if you do want to use um, that, that's a good place to start. Um, and you can 
play with it with, uh, I think ML term is a good terminal just for displaying these things right off the bat without needing to mess with options. Uh, and then some reading lists here. So the, you know, we've got some good Windows console references and escape codes, and the Xterm control sequences one at the end is sort of decades of, of lists of history of all these different things that we built on top of our um, terminal sequences. All right, thank you.